Welcome and aloha. My name is Mark Schlav. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea program. And today we're going to go across the sea to New Zealand to talk with my friend, New Zealand lawyer, Neil Russ. Hawaii and New Zealand seem to have a lot in common. We're both islands, a bunch of islands in the Pacific Ocean. Uh, but the viewpoint may be different. And I've asked Neil to describe the view from New Zealand. Neil, welcome. Good to see you. Uh, usually we meet uh, somewhere in Asia uh, during the year at a law convention, the, the Inter-Pacific Bar Association. Uh, but today you're, you're in Auckland. Is that right? It's correct, Mark. You're right. Nice to see you. Yeah, welcome. Welcome. And uh, it is also, it's Tuesday. Correct. In Auckland, right? So yeah. you're in the future. You're in the future for us. And I'd like to know what the future holds, really. But first of all, uh, tell us a little bit about your background, uh, where you were born, grew up, uh, how you got involved in the law, and uh, what type of law you do. And uh, what, what, you know, generally what it's like to be a lawyer in, in, in New Zealand. Yeah, sure, Mark. Well, well first, thanks very much for um, inviting uh, me to speak with you. It's always great to uh, speak with any lawyer from any other jurisdiction uh, because we always learn something. And uh, I uh, very much value the opportunity to speak uh, to you today and um, hopefully to... Uh, uh, talk through some issues of, of common interest and, and maybe maybe a few differences uh, that are quite actually quite important differences uh, between the way New Zealand's been going about things and um, in, in the US, for example, on a couple of levels, uh, and also uh, just just a bit of a reflection about what that might mean for for us and our clients um, as we as we all move together into into the future. So I, um, I was born in New Zealand. I, I grew up in uh, a little town uh, near Wellington, which is the capital city. And um, that was in the, uh, in the 60s. And then I went to university uh, in Victoria University of Wellington, which is uh, uh, naturally I, I think of as New Zealand's best uh, law school. Uh, I initially thought I was going to be a marine biologist, and that was where my passion lay uh, in science and biology. Uh, and then I was skiing with a, with some friends of mine, uh, mountaineering and ski touring, in fact. And one of them was a lawyer, and he told me about his his uh, life and his his, his role. Uh, and I thought that was pretty interesting. So for one semester, I tried. Uh, a law paper at university. Uh, I, I sailed through my science papers, but the law was hard, and I thought that was a really good challenge, and so I stuck with it. And um, so I, I became, I was admin, admitted to the bar in New Zealand uh, in late 1986, and then traveled to England to work for six years, 1988 to 94. So I was working at a very small firm called Clifford Chance, um, and uh, really, enjoying, <laughs> really enjoying doing doing uh, all kinds of banking, derivatives, tax, uh, structured financing work, restructuring. There, I learned a lot. Um, one of the things that happened in London was I went on secondment to uh, a bank, uh, and that gave me a really good insight into things that matter for clients. So it's not all about the law, it's sometimes what you can do with the law. And also packaging what you say into meaningful statements that a client can use uh, can be more important than, than being the best lawyer in, in the world. Um, so those were some pretty valuable lessons for me. Now so, that, that actually sounds like good advice for a, a young lawyer too, or a law student, is it's, it's not just in the books, it's in the experience too. And, and your experience of actually being in the bank uh, with the actual client, as opposed to being in the law firm, is a valuable, most 
lawyers don't get that opportunity. Yeah, that, that's right. So Clifford Chance was quite good at operating secondment programs. So they were very keen that clients and 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 their their lawyers um, got together and work collaboratively and uh, that that benefited both, uh, both both sides and and I think that's a very valuable very valuable lesson uh, you know, that's that's really I'm sorry that that's really a, a a a great advice for a law firm <laughs> uh, it, to to do that type of thing I mean that's that helps out not just the lawyers but the law firm and the client all at the same time yeah, I mean, the, the, for the big law firms, of course, there tends to be a cost associated with that. And uh, especially if you risk losing some of your best people during the most productive periods to go off into a, uh, into a client environment, particularly since often those arrangements don't pay that well for the law firm. So there, there's, there's another issue that I'm sure will come up at some point, Mark, uh, around is money the most important thing uh, personally I, I don't think so uh, i think there's there's more to it than that but um you know there is a balancing act to, uh, to be struck by 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 the relevant firm concerned that's for sure okay so at, at some point you decided to come back home to new zealand how did that come about and what what do you have to do to become a lawyer in new zealand i mean you have to pass a bar exam and like we do here yeah, so un, uh, unlike, as I understand it, in the US, you do an undergraduate degree and then you'll do your, your legal qualification and then you'll pass your bar, the bar exam. Uh, in New Zealand, you can do law as an undergraduate degree. Uh, I did, I did honours as, as sort of an enhanced undergraduate degree. And then you do, when I did it, you do a year's study, additional papers, to part and then you have further exams to pass the bar exam and become admitted. Um, so that will be a minimum of five years, and it's broadly the same today. Uh, I guess the difference is you can become qualified to practice at a relatively young age in, in New Zealand. So if you if you left uh, school uh, and went to university at say. The 17 or 18 years old, you could be, you could be qualified in early 20s. Um, so that's that. That I think is a bit of a difference. Um, many lawyers, though, they take two degrees, or they'll take a little longer to um, to 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 get there. Uh, so there are no particular um, time limits except for for, for that. Um, there are some requirements beyond that, though. If you wish to practice by yourself on your own account, there are some minimum periods of practice that have to be satisfied. So there's a minimum period of three years before you can become eligible to become a partner in a law firm, for example, and a minimum period of, of seven years before you become eligible for certain um, positions, including um, being appointed to the bench. So, so, so you, you you need to get some experience under your belt. That's the the legal. And, and is, is this under a bar association or the government or or what is it? We we here in Hawaii we have a bar association. I think most states are like that. We are required to belong to the bar association. Uh, who who you know is is that what happens in New Zealand too? Uh, not not quite. So in New Zealand we have the New Zealand Law Society, which has a dual role. It, it is the regulator of all lawyers in New Zealand. And it is also um, running an educational and advocacy and law reform role separately. So, so in New Zealand, the New Zealand Law Society is the central um, bar association equivalent that, that is involved in the majority of lawyers practices. So for example, Every year, you must pay uh, a practicing fee to to get your practicing certificate, and there are various statements and minimum uh, professional development hours and things like that that have to be complied with. Uh, so that's the New Zealand Law Society. New Zealand Law Society looks after that. Ironically, membership of that society is not obligatory, so you can be regulated by an entity that you're not a member of, 
but something like <laughs> 90, 90, I know, but 95% or, or more lawyers in New Zealand belong to the law society, probably 97, 98. In addition, there are, there are other bar associations. So because New Zealand lawyers are both what we call barristers, that is people with a right to appear in court, and solicitors, that is people who interact in offices with, with clients, we have what's called a fused profession of those two roles. Some lawyers elect to become barristers sole. So they simply appear in court for clients and they will take their instructions from solicitors. Um, and uh, that's called the intervention rule. Those barristers, they have a separate bar association called the New Zealand Bar Association. Um, and that's a voluntary thing. And there are also other, some other regional um, uh, bar associations that, that, that exist. But the majority of lawyers in New Zealand find themselves dealing day to day and in a very real regulatory sense with the New Zealand Law Society. Okay, so you, you got back to, uh, you came back to New Zealand, Neil, and yep. you started practicing in New Zealand. And now, where, where are you now? I mean, what, what happened? Where, where, what, is, <laughs> what happened? What is the course of your career? What type of law are you doing now? Okay, thanks, Mark. So in 94, I, I came back to New Zealand. I'd been offered a partnership in Buttle Finlay, which is one of New Zealand's large commercial law firms, while I was still in London. Uh, and I was in the partnership process in London as well. Um, but for a range of reasons at that time, um, taking a partnership in a New Zealand law firm with a um, uh, whole bunch of things going on seemed like a really good idea. And so I, I, I did that and I came back and I practiced banking, derivatives, taxation, law, and within a short period of time, for a variety of um, unexpected reasons, partners in Buttle Finlay, the, the tax partners, uh, began leaving. And it was just an age and stage thing. And one of them had identified an opportunity to become a specialist barrister, for example. And, you know, I, I, these things happen. So the firm asked me to, to step in and to run the tax practice. Now I'd done tax in, in England and I'd done quite a lot as part of my banking and structured finance work, but I wasn't really at that point a specialist tax practitioner. Uh, and I stepped in and moved from the Auckland office to the Wellington office of, of, of the firm and ran the, the tax practice down there until about 2000. And then we restructured the practice, brought it all to Auckland, which was where the majority of our commercial clients were focused. And which is also the best gateway into Australia and up into Asia. And so we ran the, we ran the tax practice from, from the Auckland office. Uh, and I did that until uh, 2019, when I set up a specialist firm of my own uh, and that just does tax and anti-money laundering work. So we identified that there was a gap in the market that a firm like Buttle Finlay couldn't fill and no one else was filling it. So that's why we jumped in. Okay, and you know, I got to ask you about this anti-money laundering. Uh, I, I mean, that's the first I heard of it. What is it? How did it come about? I mean, and, and is it... I mean, is it going to be the new normal in law practice everywhere? Well, what is it about anti-money laundering as a specialty? What, what is it? Please explain okay. it. So, so internationally, the OECD for years has been, uh, through the Financial Action Task Force, has been promoting uh, across the globe this idea that banks in particular need to know their client, they need to verify who their clients are, they need to get information from their clients about where that client's money has come from, you know, source of wealth, source of funds, what's going on with that client. Anti-money laundering and countering the financing of terrorism is all about making sure that dirty money or money that's being used for illegal purposes isn't 
uh, being cleansed and, and, and re-entering the financial system. In New Zealand in 2009, we legislated to require the banks and financial um, service companies to become subject to these measures, which required uh, essentially verification of the identity of people who are dealing with those institutions and tracing of, of the funds in, in certain circumstances. And there's an allied reporting obligation to, the, to a specialist unit of the New Zealand police as well, if suspicious activity is, is detected. Now, all of that sounds very unloyally, right? Because lawyers yeah. are used to confidentiality, they're used to executing client instructions, and uh, frankly, they don't ask a lot of questions often about what their clients are up to. Uh, we trust, typically, we trust our clients. We, we think that uh, they're doing legal things and we are doing things properly. In New Zealand, once the banks became regulated, it became inevitable that other financial, financially involved entities such as lawyers, accountants, and real estate agents in particular, would become subject to the same type of rules. So now, for certain types of activities only, not everything a lawyer does, but for certain types of activities, before you start a business relationship with a new client, you must find out who that client is. If it's a company or a trust or some opaque business structure, you need to find out who owns, who's behind that uh, client? Who owns that, that, that client? You know, really, not just sort of notionally. And then in certain circumstances with high risk clients or high risk jurisdictions, you've got to find out where that money has come from. And you need to retain evidence of what you've discovered, keep those records and have those audited every two years. So there's, um, Actually, you could say somewhat cynically that the lawyer has moved from the, the confidant of uh, the client into an unpaid government uh, spy agency uh, in relation to illegal client activities. Um, and that's perhaps an uncharitable characterization, but we certainly are seeing the role of lawyers shifting perceptibly now and the confidentiality that has hitherto been the cornerstone of that client relationship has been somewhat eroded. So, and that's a area of law that is recent. Was there something that prompted that, some terrorist activity, or was there some reason that New Zealand, I mean, I, I, I don't think we have something similar in the United States. I, I, and so why did New Zealand get in front of this? So, um, as I say, it was always coming at some point once the, once the banks became subject to anti-money laundering. Lawyers in New Zealand operate trust accounts. So uh, many lawyers uh, do, not all. Uh, my firm doesn't, for example. Uh, but larger law firms or, or specialist law firms dealing in real estate, um, property conveyancing, they'll operate a trust account and they can be transacting uh, on behalf of clients through those trust accounts. So they were seen as a risk issue um, akin to banks because they could do things under the cloak of anonymity afforded by, by the legal instruction relationship. And so what was happening, uh, New Zealand was under, under scrutiny for a lot of its trust regimes and there was a report issued in relation to uh, our so-called foreign trusts which in some people's view were being improperly used or capable of being improperly used uh, as a uh, tax haven. And as a consequence of that report, the spotlight came on lawyers to be regulated uh, and to be more transparent about their dealings with, with clients and to justify those relationships if necessary in a bit more depth. And so that, that's what happened in, nine, in uh, 2018, uh, quite quickly, in fact, lawyers were brought into the regime uh, with maybe only nine months notice. Wow. Well, 
Uh, I, that is very interesting. And I, I just wonder if it's going to be something that we in the United States are gonna see more of. I think New Zealand is maybe ahead of the curve on that. And we're gonna take a one minute break right now. And then I wanna ask about the COVID-19 pandemic. And I mean, I've heard a lot of things that New Zealand is ahead of the curve on that too. So I'd like to ask you a little bit about how that is affecting just generally the population and the law profession. So we'll take a one minute break and we'll be right back. Aloha, I'm Kili'i Akina, the host of Hawaii Together on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. Hawaii Together deals with the problems we face in paradise and looks for solutions, whether it's with the economy, the government, or society. We're streamed live on Think Tech bi-weekly at 2 p.m. on Mondays. I want to thank you so much for watching. We look forward to seeing you. Again, I'm Kili'i Akina. Aloha. Schwabs, host of Law Across the Sea. We are back with Neil Russ. Neil, tell me, what has New Zealand done with the COVID-19 pandemic? How has it affected the citizens? How has it affected the law profession? Yeah, well, I, my own situation is probably reasonably uh, useful uh, to illustrate how the uh, how New Zealand has has dealt with all of this. Uh, I went skiing in uh, Canada on the 6th of March, and at that time there was this little concern that maybe there might be something going on in the world. Um, uh, Vancouver seemed pretty fine, uh, certainly Whistler, the snow was epic, and we got back to uh, a completely changed world. So in New Zealand, when I returned on the 16th of March, I had to go into a 14-day mandatory self-isolation. Uh, and so that was followed shortly after by a complete lockdown of the country, uh, which we have only recently emerged from. So we had five weeks where businesses were closed, movement was restricted, you couldn't drive, you couldn't go anywhere. Um, you, you could only go to the to the supermarket for essential shopping, uh, to the chemist, or to access medical assistance. That was it. So New Zealand went hard and went early. So that was um, in in March, and then um, the total numbers of infections in New Zealand as of yesterday, I think we were fourteen hundred and ninety seven. Uh, that's total infections that have been counted, including probable cases. And then there have been 21 deaths. So by global standards, uh, about uh, 10 of those actually were in one rest home. Very unfortunate situation where a, a, a dementia unit, um, it got in there and um, some people were already uh, very unwell. And, and so uh, there were some very unfortunate deaths there. But, but by global standards, that's amazing, right? Population right. of 5 million people. Most of those 1,400 cases uh, were imported. That is, they were contracted overseas um, or they were family members of people who'd been overseas and they caught it from them. Very few cases were what we call community transmission. So New Zealand went hard, it went early, and we're just now, in two days' time, emerging from that lockdown. Uh, we've gone from what's called level four, which is that complete lockdown, to level three. We've been there for just uh, under two weeks, uh, and that allows people to move around a little bit, but not much. And now we're going to level two. So businesses, shops, um, hospitality, that kind of thing, will begin to reopen from Thursday, New Zealand time, uh, and schools will go back on Monday. 
So kids so far have been learning from home. So it's been a very different world uh, for for us all here here in New Zealand. It's uh, been how, how about how, how about how about lawyers? I mean, what do you, do the lawyers? Um, I mean, a lot of our lawyers here in Hawaii were just working from home. Is that the same in New Zealand? Yeah, that's that's been our experience too. So most lawyers have been able to utilize technology. Uh, to great effect, so using um, video uh, conferencing systems and uh, just good practices in terms of working collaboratively online uh, to, to work from home. Uh, and they've been able to do that quite successfully. The economy, though, has been really battered by this because if you can imagine shutting down an economy completely for, for five weeks, some of the business that we were doing, some of the work we were doing for clients, has just stopped because you know, transactions that made sense two months ago just do not make sense anymore. The economics aren't there. Uh, some clients are going to the wall. One law firm has said it will close as a result of, of its COVID-19 uh, experience, and, and that's very unfortunate. Um, uh, that was a, a law firm that did a lot of mergers and acquisitions work, and they just had nothing. They were doing nothing. Uh, so, so in in and in in law firms, uh, I understand that you know if they can do work from home, they will. But like businesses, like the hospitality, I mean that's a big business here in Hawaii, New Zealand. I, I know, and especially in Auckland, where I've been several times, uh, hospitality is big. Are you allowing people to come in now from other countries, or how, how is how's the hospitality? industry treating? So New Zealand is closed uh, to anyone other than New Zealand residents or certain people with with a special uh, permission, one of permission. Broadly speaking, New Zealand is closed. If a New Zealander returns, they have to go into a mandatory government facility for 14 days and they are, it's essentially a quarantine scenario. Uh, if they show they're tested and if they show any signs then they are literally quarantined uh, so you cannot really come to New Zealand at the moment uh, as an interim measure domestic uh, uh, tourism is being promoted um, and hopefully as well we're going to have what's called the trans-Tasman bubble with Australia and we'll have um, the ability to travel to Australia for um, for holidays and vice versa so you you mentioned a government facility for 14 days so that's something that's set up by the new zealand government and it's controlled by the government and it, it, i mean it's it, it means you have to you're kind of in lockdown is what i hear yeah, yeah they're local hotels so hotels that would have had tourists in them are, are now being uh repurposed for these um these these quarantine purposes and uh so you're you're under you're under not guard exactly, but you're unable to leave. Is there is there security there, or is it you know is there government security that is overlooking people? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's it's a private sector, but it is uh, it is making sure that people do not leave. Yeah, that's that's correct. Um, the New Zealand government's taken it incredibly seriously. That's for sure. Okay, now. What is the future here? I mean, where, where, I mean, what, it seems that New Zealand is a little bit ahead of us, maybe, but what, where, I mean, is, is there talk about where it's going or what to expect? Well, we, we could end up with this dystopian world, right? We, we, we've got a bubble of non infectious populations. So, Australia, New Zealand, South Pacific. Those countries, uh, such as Fiji, uh, Tahiti, Samoa, uh, and, and others in this region, could find themselves isolated from other economies in terms of tourism and travel. Uh, trade will continue, um, and and that's fine, but um, we could we could end up with a situation where the U.S. has been through the worst of it. Europe's been through the worst of it, the UK, uh, but other countries like New Zealand are just unable to, to get involved um, in, in, in the tourism. I mean, that was a big deal for us. Tourism 
brought in um, 4 million visitors or something a year. I'm not exactly sure of the numbers, but it was very, very significant. And that's just gone, that whole sector. So yeah, wow. well, we're struggling. Yeah, yeah. So we're, we're all kind of finding our way. Uh, now, Neil, we have about a minute left. What would you like people to know about New Zealand? What, what would you like the rest of the world to know about the place where you live and call home? Uh, it's closed for now, but it's a friendly, welcoming, beautiful country. And I would certainly love to see uh, as many people as possible come here and enjoy it as soon as it's safe. It's a, it's a great place. It's a safe place. And uh, it, it's the kind of, it's a kind of place, that, especially the South Island, which is full of mountains and glaciers and, uh, you know, uh, forest and so on. It's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful country and it's well worth visiting. Uh, and it's also uh, maybe closed for now for people, uh, but it remains open for business for lawyers. So we're still, we're still here. Well, okay, Neil, I appreciate your time. It's uh, nice talking to you. Uh, although it'd be nice to be uh, in person and maybe the, that's where the future will be. Uh, but uh, we say aloha, what do you say in, in, in New Zealand? Uh, well, we would, we would typically greet someone with kia ora. Kia ora. And we would, or haere mai, and we would farewell them with haere ra. All right. Well, thank you very much for being my, my guest today, uh, Neil, and uh, look forward to the next time we're together. Aloha. Thank you. Thanks, Mark.